thank you, Alan, for your kind words. I really must say that it is the biggest honor that I've ever had in my life to have been invited by the Wikimedia community to speak here before you and share some ideas that we have been working on in many different places. So I really feel honored and happy that you would think of me as someone who has something interesting to share. So I think I'm here because I've been working for many years in an institution in Madrid called Media Lab Prado, or Media Lab Prado, where we have been fighting to get the name Citizenship Laboratory. And as you know, there was recently a very relevant political change in my city in Madrid, and the new city hall has created a series of billboards that they've put up around the city where they say that Media Lab Prado is a center for digital manufacturing. That's what it says. And then in others, it, they call it a citizen's lab. And that's also something that makes me very happy. And so what I'm here to share with you today is, first of all, why we want to fight to get that name of citizen's lab. And then, I'd also like to discuss the problem here with you, and as an open dialogue, let's say, the notion of what an archive is. How should we deal with information, the information that is constantly produced in Media Lab Prado? We constantly get, or we claim to be, a center that is open open to any project that comes from a civil society organization, an interest group, a social movement, or a collective of citizens who believe they know how to make things right, how to make our city better. And so we receive them with open arms. And we have identified in these past few years that social movements are evolving. They're moving in a very interesting direction. Something that we can really sum up in three points. These are organizations that have that are either in process of transition or who have transitioned from um, being in a contestation role to a proposal role. So they've decided through their own resources, through uh, their own self-management, to look for solutions for the community. And these are original ideas and original uh, community efforts, and they're embracing ideas that and values that we feel are signals um, that we've seen from failed institutions where, for example, we've seen um, there's sporadic membership, there's fragile members of an initiative. We see this as a big error before, and now we can see this as an enormous quality of this new type of organization that is emerging. So the first characteristic, as I was saying, was that they're moving from protest to, um, to proposals. And now the second area is that looking at the experimental culture and beginning to address with more cognitive dignity and political dignity to the ex culture of experience, or that was experiential. This is an important change as well, because in this transition, what we're playing with here is quite significant, because while we see an experimental culture, there's very few people who are able to speak with with full uh, identity of the project, etc., because it's quite sophisticated language. It's about experiments. It's tools, costly tools, difficult practices, uh, hard to learn, but one that's based on experience rather than experiment. 
is one that we're all experts in. This is one where we can all be experts in our own experiences, of course. If Whether you're a diabetic, then you can um, know more about diabetes than your own doctor, for example. And those who might have mental um, illness might know much more about this area than their psychiatrist. And so we can see how this sort of brief summary can be extended to all the different people and their experiences. Now, the third characteristic that I think is quite relevant and shows a new change in the times is that they're made up of people who before were considered were were trying to reclaim political rights. It was as if citizens had been trained to exercise their capacity to demand rights. But what we're seeing now with the new ways of exercising citizenship is that now we're able to produce infrastructures. We're able to produce infrastructures that improve common uh, living. Or, or improve things for everyone, for public good. So we're seeing new techniques. Sometimes we're seeing a matrix of perhaps things that are more um, theoretical in, in the different workshops. But the idea is focused on prototypes. And a prototype means two things. One's, one's quite obvious, of course, that anyone can say quite immediately when they look at a prototype, which is that the ability to anticipate something that will then be fully developed. So it's something that's tentative. It's something that's provisional. It's something that's not fleeing from error. Rather, it considers that errors are a part of a source of learning. So these are models that can anticipate things. This is very important. But also, another aspect of this that is very important is that these are open. When I say that they're open, what do I mean? That no one has the right to close it. No one can have the last word, the final say. It's something that for nature, by nature, it's something that constant in its very constitution is inclusive. So it ensures that it's open to all possibilities. And these could include the arrival of new people with new concerns, with new epistemies and new cultures that would also consider themselves with the right to opine upon this new prototype or the prototype production. So for all of this is very important. This is this idea of the prototype, this notion, is so important for us. And we're, we consider that this is a prototype workshop where prototypes are created and tested. And we're not too concerned about getting results that can be objectified, uh, that products can be produced, that can be come independent from the community who's just created it. What for us is important is that we are working on prototypes, and when we're in the process of building it and creating it, in reality, what we're doing is learning how to live together, all of us together, people who are quite heterogeneous, who come from many distinct cultures, who are from different ages, for example. This is a characteristic that defines new social movements that are always defined in this way. And this is a characteristic, a differential characteristic in contrast to, for example, the academic culture, which is extremely homogeneous. So what's the issue? In citizen labs, they're not built to make things, not like academic labs. Rather, they're the opportunity that we're giving ourselves to learn together in a very complex world and that perhaps requires a great deal of technology and science and much and a great deal of knowledge, but it doesn't exclude anyone. It gives value and puts the value on experience. So the question that we're, we're asking and, and in our media lab, we've been doing this for quite a while, and we hope that you can help us to understand the question better, is 
what can we do to preserve all of this patrimony that we're creating with practices, with activities, with projects, with communities, so that it can be useful and be of service to people who are in other cities, in other continents, in other problems that are being faced? Uh, if, is there anything that we can share, in fact? So Media Prado and many other new cultures of art and technology that are dispersed through many cities throughout the world, uh, we, we focused on documenting. And this was something that we have. It's almost like a, a mantra. It's like, we won't do anything here without documenting it. And we're always recording it to be able to retransmit it and to put it online and to tag it and send it lots of people to, and everybody's taking pictures. And, and we thought that this was enough. We felt that converting knowledge into information was a key task, a constituting task, in fact, a, a core activity of any sort of initiative like the Citizen Lab. But what we realized is that though we were doing this very well and we were model and we were exemplary in documenting, and then we went to our archive and what we saw was that it was just a repository, a repository of materials, a lot of, of material. In fact, it was difficult to manage because it was getting very large and we couldn't even find what we wanted to find. So we were the ones who were in fact most linked to the project and to this information and yet what we were producing, this type of material, no one wants to see it. Maybe we were recording, you know, an hour or two hour long intervention or a conference. Who can watch two hours on television? No one can do that. So we're quite certain that we're doing things wrong and that things could be done better. But what could we do to, to, to make this better? And to do this better, my way of addressing the problem or making a prototype to address this problem was to say, what is the community that's doing this in an exemplary way? And now there are many, many communities, but I just want to mention three because we don't have so much time either. And I'd like to stop talking soon so that we could converse about this and have a conversation amongst all of us about it. But what I would like to talk about are three communities that do show a difference between building a repository or an archive and doing something that we should aspire to and that, in fact, we should aspire to do urgently. The first community that caught my eye was described by a young woman who's dedicated her entire life to it, in fact. Beko Beach. She studied uh, lesbian communities and uh, especially was doing, she was doing this in California. And so what we've seen is a collective who had an urgent need to um, build an archive and to where the, the singing voice would not be the most media or most uh, media minded or most activist or most public eye uh, people, the famous ones, the ones who have most visibility. Rather, the idea was how to go about this by asking from a global concept of the archive of, of pain, of suffering, in fact, that has existed, uh, that has transformed many of the women in the community into invisible people. And no one's ever asked them if they have something to say, or it would seem as if um, many times their voice was, was silenced. So that archive is dedicated to them. This is a long story, and I, I have to be clear here. I mean, a woman has dedicated her entire life to this, and I, I'm trying to do this like in two minutes, and I really hope that I'm not just running over uh, and crashing through something that's very important. But she came to a conclusion that the participants in the project did not want the archive to be separated, the production that they were doing in front of a camera or that they were writing they didn't want it to be separated from the community. And they've really fought so that this archive doesn't end up in some huge institution that's dedicated to archiving uh, documents. And they, what they wanted was it would be uh, in the heart of the community. And I think that this is very relevant. And this example also caught my eye for two points. One, because of the testimony of a court, of those who didn't have a story to tell or who are not considered, in quotes, important or no one ever asked them, for them, the, it, it, they, 
they wanted it to be rather in a site that was fully accessible. They felt that the archive wasn't a place where they would go and deposit things that were left over. It was rather a space for community exploration of all of the problems uh, that are associated with being a lesbian. So it was a research space. It offered and would allow a, 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 a research space and also of a memory. Now, the second example is another woman, Marie Sabran, who's dedicated a lot of time to thinking to um, Zapatista corn. And Zapatistas discovered that the introduction of trans um, seeds was not only destroying their gen genetic and biological patrimony um, and biogenetic patrimony, but it was also destroying their own culture. It wasn't just an abstract concept of culture, it was the way of living. So they felt that it was important to do a seed archive that wasn't focused on conserving seeds, but rather to protect a style of a way of life. But to be able to do this, they had to have a genetics uh, laboratory with experts from throughout the world and, and look for people who could dedicate their knowledge and their time and even their life so that they could go and move to Chiapas to be able to make a genetic map of these seeds and in this way know what they're defending. So in, uh, against the genetically modified um, corn. So they were not just defending a way of life, but they were also working, uh, working against uh, a very technologically and sophisticated uh, process that was affecting their context at that time. The third example was again from another woman, Miliana Taylor. She's dedicated her entire life to performance. When we think of archive and culture, we're almost always thinking about something that has been literalized. <laughs> In other words, it's been written down. It's, it's something that that everything has a written word, but the majority of what human beings do um, is not written down, especially those cultures that have um, less access to cultural goods. And it's very common and natural to resort to performance. So there are many people who would like to archive theater, who would like to archive dance. And, and create archives about this, but they're always quite disappointed when they try to do this because when they look at what's been archived, they realize that they're not seeing what's truly important, that's truly reflecting that. You can see the, the pirouette, but they're not looking at the relation, relationality that happens between those who are receiving and those who are giving the performance. Or, and so good dance and good choreography occurs not just because there's a, a person who has in a virtuous body who can do pirouettes in front of others who can't do that. Rather, it breaks this division between those who know how to dance and those who know how to be excited while other people dance. But the camera can't capture this. This is something that's invisible. It's Everything that's tested, in fact, is invisible. But all archives face the same problem. It doesn't matter where we are. Archives never can see anything that's not written down. So they're not able to see 99.9% .9 of the world's population. They're not seeing what's truly happening to us. They always see what happened. Like, for example, in the case of the lesbian community, or those who are in the press, or those who know how to uh, do an interview, they were the ones who had a lot to say and were the ones that were being archived. But uh, lesbianism isn't limited to that. So the three cases uh, give us give us a lot of food for thought about asking what is what we should be saving, what should we be archiving. You know, are we looking at a project to transform knowledge into information? Are every time that one seriously talks about the idea of an archive, what to, to what to capture, what to preserve? They come up against this problem of how to 
how how to address this. It's a question for all of us. How can all knowledge just be information? Because for benevolent people, it's perhaps the only thing that people know how to save. For those people who aren't so benevolent, and maybe they're more dedicated to neoliberal um, projects, they're interested in information because it's the only thing they can sell. What we can transform into uh, information. So that's why it's so important to ask us ourselves as Mira Lab Prado, and this is, of course, my concrete experience, but I'm sure that everyone here has their own specific experience in their organizations and movements and your own laboratories as uh, citizen labs. And what's worth filming? What's worth, what's worth this idea where, where it was our, part of our core constitution, we felt we were doing something so important and we had to document it all. How to, to be able to realize what's going on, we felt that we had to have a camera there and, and share it on the network and that that would be enough. It's not sufficient. I'm convinced it's not sufficient. And I want to take the last one or two minutes that I have, two or three minutes that I have, to come to some closing remarks, but also to share some proposal about what we should begin to focus on. Uh, if it, to the extent that we're capable to do so. The first thing is that in the different cases that we've just examined, the archive is constructed as part of um, a survival mechanism. It's, it's, not, it's not an uh, identity uh, nature. This idea of who we are is created inside and also outside, and it can also be part of an exclusion project because of those who are left outside. So this isn't so much a question of who we are. Rather, it's a question of who do we do we want to survive? How do we want? What do we want to preserve or keep being? The other proposal or sort of conclusion that I'd like to share is that, is that as we do this, as we're trying to transform knowledge into information, every time that we do this, what we believe that must be saved is that which can be codified. And what's happening then is that we are denying or, or letting go a huge quantity of information that has to do with common knowledge. It also has to do with knowledge from the people who have the most needs and the most urgency that they have that someone should share how they're seeing the world, um, how they think the world should change. So the second aspect is this new ability that we need to develop all the more and we must perfect. To focus on what's local, what's on the periphery, what's um, a minority, what is being associated with projects that have a great deal of difficulty to be those who, who cannot be visible, um, to, to stop being affected by everything or by all and see how this becomes more and more acute. It's as if living with the gorillas and Licky who went to do that when Jane Goodall went with them, with, with the gorillas. Oh, I only have five minutes. Okay, perfect. Well, this woman had the, the greatest capacity to look at the details, and, and that's another condition. That, that there'd be people without any experience in studies and did not have a lot of, you know, uh, academic credit because that person would have to learn how to unlearn because they'd have to arrive with no um, biases without already having a learned lesson in their head. Well, why? Because you have to stop being affected by the different gestures. For example, in the case of, of, of um, Jane Goodall, was they're, they're not assume about their gestures and, and get herself trained amongst them and understand their gestures. So. She, in her case, she came. The person who hasn't learned anything about these things would have a greater ability to. They wouldn't have to unlearn things. They could just go straight into learning more. And that's something that we could take in an archive concept of learning from Jane Goodall. We cannot be affected by all of the things that we can tend to consider as irrelevant in our archives. 
And the third point that I think comes up with all connects to all of what I've been saying is the the imagine the imagine the imaginary and imaginations of the witness of the of the journalist. These the, this is not who we should be looking to for inspiration, but rather from the the imaginings of the comic of the artist of the poet who have been betting on this ability throughout their lives to be able to detect something quite unique and, and singular, uh, uh, some greatness uh, in everything that is around them. Fourth, what should be archived? I'm not sure if I can even express this with a great amount of clarity, but I am clear what I'd like to be able to do. What we should be archiving is everything that we've experienced, but we don't know how to say it. We don't have words for it to, to find a way to say it. And if we don't have words for it because we're, we're uh, more or less foolish, uh, but it's because we haven't thought about it enough. We haven't given enough weight or value to the experience. If we had more time, I could give you some examples of communities of people who have been affected who, when they give importance to what they've experienced, they've been able to achieve and find the words to be able to say everything that they've experienced. And I think that any of us have seen many times to know that something important has happened, but they don't know quite how to them, but they don't know quite how to express it. So the 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 point of this project that I'm describing is the co collective capacity to be able to find the words, and that means reinventing the world. It means finding other narratives to be able to say what we didn't know how to tell. So the last thing that I think is also interesting to add uh, amongst the many projects that have caught my eye in, in Madrid, and I've been studying and, and seeing that there are many different projects that are quite similar in other parts of the world. Uh, there's something called Sugama, which is a project that's been built from an idea, from the constituting principle of this, Yeah, uh, is um, um, it's called basurama, like um, which is based on the word garbage, and it's um, we are what we throw away is the concept and their driving force, and so we get rid of all of those things that we feel don't are that are useless. We think that that they there's no good to keeping them, and that which we keep, we have a lot of discourse and words, and we perhaps even can use all of them. We have lots of theories around it and rhetoric about. And also a lot of resources are invested and oriented at, to self-justify why we have these things and giving visibility uh, and great appearances to things that might be doubtful or strange. So this trust in trash as a faithful witness of who we truly are, you know, what we don't appreciate and what we do appreciate. In fact, the project that we're talking about is one that consists in this, of giving a great deal of importance uh, to what we traditionally, what scientists and what people who develop discord think about. The archive looks at what those people say is relevant, what really gets to the point is what those people are saying is important, instead of giving dignity to that the experience or what has been experienced. It, it, it responds to the hegemonic discourse. I think that we are what we throw away. And I think that Citizen Labs, what the new ones, what they're doing is looking at um, what's common, what isn't assigned a value that it never gets into an archive, that's never been exposed or had its own um, fare. It's, this is what that is focused on. That's it.